My name is Doug Prawl. I'm a faculty member in the Department of Psychological Science at Northern Kentucky University. I'm a social psychologist. Social psychology, as you might know, is kind of like the study of regular everyday life. We have topics like uh, attitudes, attraction, helping behavior, aggression, forming impressions of others, stereotyping and prejudice, group behavior, things like that, things that we might observe in regular everyday life. Uh, in this recording, I'd like to talk about a particular thing that's kind of a well-known uh, phenomenon in social psych, uh, having to do with helping behavior called the bystander effect. So let's see if I can go ahead and share my screen. All right, there we go. So the bystander effect has to do with the fact that when there's someone who needs help, like maybe an emergency situation or something like that, sometimes it's not really safer to be in a crowd because if there's a crowd of people there who could potentially help, sometimes the crowd can be a hindrance to helping. And so if I'm there and there's a person who needs help and there's a bunch of other people around and they're not helping, then that can be a hindrance to me helping. The individual who needs help. Uh, just today, I was reading about this account where there was a person who was, I guess, a, I guess, stabbed and was lying on the ground bleeding or something like that. And there were other people around, but instead of helping this person, they just took out their cell phones and started recording it, which is, you know, disturbing. Anyway, so Latin and Darley, two well-known social psychology people began to do research on this thing that came to be called the bystander effect. And they developed a whole model about the way helping works. And uh, in their model of helping, the basic idea is that there's a variety of stages or steps that we have to get through on our way to helping. And so if we, for example, make it through step one, but we stumble at step two, then we won't help. If we make it through steps one, two, and three, but we don't make it through step four, then we're not going to help either. The only way to help is to make it successfully through all of the stages. All right, so let's take a look at each of the stages and I'll point out at least one problem that could hinder helping at that point. Okay, so first of all, before we can help someone, of course, we have to notice that something is happening. And in this case, the other people who are there, other bystanders, could hinder uh, helping because of distraction. Maybe they're blocking our view, maybe they're making a lot of noise and things like that. And so there might be a person over there who needs help, but if there's a lot of other people around, we might not even realize that that's happening. Whereas if the crowd was not there, then we'd pretty easily recognize, oh look, there's a person over there and we would notice something. But let's suppose that we do notice then we have to interpret the situation as an emergency. We have to realize, oh, there's a person over there who actually needs help. And here a potential problem is this thing we call pluralistic ignorance. I always feel like pluralistic ignorance is kind of difficult to define, but the basic idea is that when there's a situation and we're uncertain, maybe we see someone over there and they're surrounded by a a group of several people and we think is that person being threatened you know are they being robbed or something like that i'm not sure in those situations where we're not sure how to react we look to other people oftentimes uh, to decide what are we going to do and so if we look around and we see that people are just looking over there and then they're just they just keep walking on by then we may decide oh silly me i was the only one who thought that might have been a problem in fact, it could be that a lot of other people also thought that might be a problem, but they're not doing anything. And we take their inaction as evidence that there really isn't anything wrong. Uh, there was a well-known study by Latin and Darley where uh, they had a person sitting at a table filling out you know, questionnaires on self-esteem or whatever it might be, and they began to pump smoke into the room. And when the person was all alone, of course, pretty quickly, they would get up and go call someone. It's like, hey, there's smoke coming in here. Something's wrong. But in another condition, there were two unresponsive bystanders. There were two other people sitting there, presumably filling out forms or something, and they didn't do anything. And so they just sit there while the room starts filling with smoke. And in that case, people were much less likely to do anything. It's like, well, these people don't seem to think there's anything wrong. Maybe 
that's just the way things are in this building. This room fills with smoke from time to time, or something like that. And so they tend to not do anything. But the next step is probably the one that receives most of the attention. Let's suppose we notice and we interpret the situation as an emergency. We decide, yes, indeed, this is an emergency. Some, this person over there needs help. Then we have to take responsibility. And this problem called diffusion of responsibility can hinder helping. Diffusion, as you might know, is the tendency for something to spread out. Like if we have a glass of water and we drop some ink into it, it's not just gonna stay in one spot, it'll diffuse throughout the glass of water. Well, in a similar way, responsibility can get spread out. If we think that there are other people who could help, we might think, well, that person needs help, but there's a lot of other people here. One of them could do something. Once again, there was another uh, well-known study by Latine and Darley where they staged an emergency. It sounded like a person was having a, a seizure or something like that and needed help. And the participants uh, were sometimes led to believe that they were the only one who was aware of this. And sometimes they were led to believe that there were other people who were also aware of this. And they looked to see what happened and they found that uh, if they thought that there were other people there, then they were less likely to intervene. And they, even if they did, it took them longer to do that. And so it seems that when we are in a situation where someone needs help, but there's a lot of other people, one potential problem could be that we decide, well, I don't necessarily have to do something. What about that person? Or what about that person? They could do something. Well, let's suppose we notice, we decide, yes, this is an emergency and I'm taking responsibility. Now I have to decide, what am I gonna do to help this person who needs help? And here a potential problem is a lack of competence or confidence. Maybe I feel like I'm just not capable of doing something. I'm not confident that I can do anything to help this person. And so that could be a hindrance. Let's suppose we notice, we interpret, we take responsibility, we decide, okay, here's what I could do to help. I know what I could do to help. Then still, before we actually help, there are potential other problems that could hinder us. Maybe we're afraid. We think, I'm going to get hurt if I go over there and try to intervene or some other problem. The one I especially want to focus on, though, is audience inhibition. Audience inhibition refers to the fact that if there are other people around and they're not acting, they're not intervening to help, then I might decide, well, maybe helping isn't the right thing to do. Maybe these people will disapprove of me if I try to intervene. They'll think I'm doing the wrong thing something like that. And so that could be a hindrance to helping. Now, I'm not saying that this is a perfect model. There's probably other factors that come into play with regard to whether people decide to help or not. But if at least something like this is true, then presumably things could be done to try to help people to make it through the various stages. For example, there was a study by Clark and Word where they found that a cry for help uh, greatly increased helping, as you might imagine. And we can understand why, because that would help people notice and decide, oh, this person needs help because they're saying, someone please help me, I need help with such and such a thing. I've heard that uh, people in the medical field, if they need assistance in an emergency situation, they're supposed to assign people jobs, like you go call 911, you go do this, you go do that. Because if they just say something like, Someone go call 911, then people may stand around and go, yeah, that's a good idea. Someone should do that, but they might not do it themselves. <laughs> Whereas if the person says, you call 911, then that's helping the person to take responsibility and to decide what to do. Okay, they told me what I should do. Okay, well, I can call 911. Yeah, I could do that. <laughs> Something like that. And so there's things that we could do to try to help people get through this, um, uh, get through the stages of this model. Okay, there's an interesting site called the Bystander Revolution. It's got a bunch of videos having to do with the idea of helping people who are in need. Uh, there's a lot of videos on there. I just picked out some that I thought were interesting and so I'm gonna go ahead and play these for you. They're pretty short. Here we go, here's one. When I was younger, I was bullied for my weight and I, took it for a while kids would tell me not to eat at lunch or they'd just call me names in the hallway and around third or fourth grade I met some girls who 
were rougher and I became friends with them and we would bully other kids and that was a good way for me to put a wall up I guess and if I hurt others first then they can't hurt me they all went to a different middle school and I came here and I did not want to come here I did not want to go through the bullying thing all over again I wanted to be with these friends and when I came here I started learning that that was not okay and that I didn't need to do that and that the people here would are more accepting so I made new friends I got out of that stuff I got more involved in school I got into our student government and I've been on it for six years now I'll be school president and I'm trying to show others that they don't have to act out that way I used to think it'd be weird to go from being so mean to suddenly nice and that seems really fake you just have to try to change you just you got to start one step at a time. You don't suddenly have to be the perfect person the next day, but just do one kind thing a day. It'll turn into two. It'll turn into three. You're never stuck being who you are. Even if you're the nicest person, that you could be a bully in an instant. So just you have to keep in mind that you can always change who you are. There was this one. girl's Instagram. And they made this Instagram name sound like someone else's Instagram name. So then this person screenshotted a picture, but like not like the profile, but the actual picture. So it looked like they actually took it and and they said, I am beautiful. And everyone started hating on the girl the picture of, was of. This girl was like in tears. She was so upset that everyone was being mean to her. And I, was, and I felt so bad. I was like, why are you guys doing this? Just, it's not her. One day, hopefully, we'll find out who it is, and we'll be able to, like, tell them, why would you do that? You just ruined part of someone's life. If you see your friend being bullied online, stick up for them. Because if you don't, who else will? You could be the one person. It only takes one person to make a difference. I should point out that the Bystander Revolution site also has uh, famous people on there. Let me give you a couple of those. Well, I have some experience with it being different things because I, I have Parkinson's and so sometimes it, I look differently than I may feel inside. And and that's the thing. I mean, sometimes people, what, what they look like on the outside and what they feel like on the inside are very different things. And and so it can be really damaging when you are feeling a certain way and someone says, it's about the way you look. And, and, and it can really throw you off because you think, well, what does it matter? And I think that I think... I think with anybody, if you see somebody getting bullied or picked on, find a moment when you can go to that person alone. If you don't have the courage to go to the person in front of other people that are bullying them, find a moment when they're alone and just kind of say, I see what's happening to you. and I feel bad about it. I don't know what I can do about it, but I feel bad about it. And maybe you can get someone else to come up to them and say, I feel bad about it too. And then the next thing you know, they've got friends and they've got at least some sense that they're not alone because that's what it's all about. It's about being alone. If you feel alone, you get nowhere to turn. This with bullying growing up where first it was name calling in school when I was younger, um, in elementary school and people would, would say mean things then. And, um, but as I started to get older and go into middle school, it was so much more cattier. And then came the cyberbullying. Somebody's older sister had said that I looked heavy and that I should start throwing up. And to say that about anybody is horrible, let alone a 14 year old girl. With cyberbullying, it's, it's a whole different world. And that's the scary part is there's no teachers, there's no parents to put their foot down and say, you can't post this about so-and-so, you know, most of the time they're not even watching. So I think it's up to the kids and the teenagers that are on these sites to take the responsibility to step up for one another and really make sure that none of this happens, um, you know, to make sure that it's being monitored. If you see something going on in front of you that's not right, you should stand up for what you believe in. You could be a hero for somebody if you stand up for someone. It's just really important that 
that person who is being hurt doesn't feel hurt and alone, but they feel like they're being supported by someone else and someone is standing up for them. Just one more. There's no question that individuals who are, quote, bystanders have more power than they realize. One person could do a lot. One compliment, a smile. Say hi. How's it going? Cool shoes. Be a friend. Say you're awesome. You're not going to get laughed at if you say you don't know that person's life. You don't know what they're going through. You don't know what their home life is. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Really? No. Stop. That's not cool. Every time that you speak out, it's one less person getting bullied every day. I think you can save someone's life if you do that. Okay, I hope you found that worthwhile.